Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you've given us the Bible. We thank you that you've given us a guidebook for our lives and, and, and examples for us to follow. But more importantly, we thank you that it is a story about who you are and what you've done and what you continue to do in our lives. The Bible is a story about you. It's not like a high school yearbook where we, we kind of look, flip through the pages and see where our name is and look for our picture, but it's, it's a picture of you. God, reveal to us more about who you are this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is Chad LaGrasse. I'm one of the pastors here at Heartland Church. Pastor Tim has just started a sabbatical for three months. Uh, you'll see him in about three months. Too soon? Too soon? Is that, that too soon? He just got done with a uh, sabbatical a little over a month ago. Some of you didn't find that near as funny as I did. Uh, but he will be back <laughs> real soon. It's not, not a three-month sabbatical. So, um, Well, this is first service, so welcome to first service. You guys, I will say, are probably the diehard Chiefs fans because you're going to actually be done before the game. So you, I'll give that to you this time. So great job being a great Chiefs fan. So this morning... We're going to go through, uh, finish up Jonah chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles or your smartphones or your tablets, uh, you can turn to Jonah chapter 4. It's also going to be in the white sheet uh, that's in your bulletin. It'll also be on the screen behind me. So Jonah is in the minor prophets uh, of the Bible, the, the smaller books where homeschoolers steal baby names from their ki- for their kids. So just kidding. If you have the YouVersion Bible app as well, you can, uh, you can download it on, the, on your phone. There is a, uh, if, you, if you download YouVersion, it's a Bible app, and you, can, you actually have the outline on your phone already, which you can, uh, it'll pop up with your location. It'll say, hey, Heartland Church has the, the Bible, the, uh, the outline on the, the Bible app itself, which is kind of neat. So the past month or so, we have been going through a series on the book of Jonah. And we're finishing that up today. But before we start, we're going to kind of run through chapter 3, and here's the, here's the plan for today. We're going, to go through, uh, we're going to go through a background of what's going on. We're going to go through chapter 4. We're going to end a little bit early. Uh, we're going to finish the outline, and I'm going to give you a couple minutes to, to think about what, we are, what we've been talking about. But Jonah was a prophet in the 8th century B.C., and it's, it's a really quick read of a book, and he was called by God to preach to these Ninevites, and because God was going to destroy the city because of its wickedness if they didn't repent. So most of us know the story, and we've been hearing it since we were, were kids, about how Jonah got swallowed by a whale. So what happened with, uh, with this is that Nineveh was the capital city of the world, the world empire, Assyria, and they were wicked, and Jonah said, I am not going to go there, God. God told him to do something, and he said, nope, I'm not going to do that. So he hopped on a ship and heads for Spain. And there is a giant storm that comes and rocks the ship. And the people on the ship are wondering what would happen. Uh, they finally figure out it's Jonah that's causing this. And they reluctantly throw him in to the sea. And instantly the storm becomes calm. So at that time, God sent a huge, provided, is the word for it, provided a huge fish, some type of sea creature, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah is in that fish for three days and three nights. And then he prays to God, and then the, the fish spits him up on dry land. And God says again, okay, now you're going to go to Nineveh, these wicked people, and you're going to say, I'm going to wipe you out if you don't repent. So in chapter 3 last week, we, we saw that he went to Nineveh and, Nineveh and did what God asked him to do. So he said, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And we find out at the end of chapter 3 that the people of Nineveh, they declare a fast, they wear sackcloth, they sit in the dust, and they call out to God for mercy. So Nineveh goes from this wicked, this powerful, this arrogant city to becoming a city of massive mourning. And they actually turn from their wickedness to do what's right. And this is an amazing miracle of God. And these people were so evil that God was going to actually wipe their entire city out from the face of the earth. But they repent, they show true remorse, they turn from their sin and begin to live right. And that's the power of God, that's a miracle that happens. You know, there have been examples, many examples in in history of entire cities or entire countries repenting and turning to God. There was one that J. Edwin Orr talks about, he's a professor of church history, and about a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
It was during the Welsh revivals of the 19th century, and, and people were so moved by what the Holy Spirit was doing. They were convicted with the Holy Spirit about some of the things they had done wrong, and one of the things they had been doing had been stealing. They had been stealing tools. They had been stealing all kinds of things uh, from these shipyards. And God prompted these people to make restitution and start returning all the stuff that they had stolen. And this actually it became so, so much of a problem for the shipyards that because they were getting all these tools, they had piles of tools, they had piles of stuff that people were bringing back that they said, we, we, we can't do this anymore. So they put up signs saying, if you have stolen anything, uh, go ahead and keep it. The Lord, the management forgives you and we want you to keep what you have stolen because they were putting so much restitution to what they had been the, so to what they had been done by the power of the Holy Spirit. The work that God had done in their lives prompted them to do so much that people said, stop giving. Okay, please stop. Wouldn't that be amazing if God did that here in America? It's where we, if we ran on a surplus instead of a deficit. Wouldn't that be amazing if we saw that in our church? Wouldn't that be amazing if we saw that in our own families? That God poured out on us so that we could pour out on other people. So let's read, let's start with chapter 3, verse 10. It's the last, uh, last verse of chapter 3. It'll set us up for chapter 4. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 said, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Now the book could have ended at this point. I mean, God told Noda, uh, Jonah to share the good news to Nineveh. He refused. He got swallowed by a whale or a big fish. After three days, he got spat up on shore. He went and preached it to Nineveh. Nineveh repented. Mission accomplished. The end. So we could have stopped last week at verse 10. You could have said, okay, mission accomplished. We're done. But God didn't stop there. So if the story's not over, why, or the story is over, why would we continue with chapter 4? Because God now is getting ready to deal with Jonah again and Jonah's heart. So we see about Jonah's reaction to the people of Nineveh, hundreds of thousands of people repenting in chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. So in the previous chapter, we see God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways. He had compassion on them and did not bring upon them destruction. They turned, they turned to God, and Jonah thinks this is very wrong, and he becomes angry. And so after Jonah is disciplined in this, this incredible way by the Lord and after Jonah's humility and repentance inside the fish and he him crying out to God, now he's, he's getting ready to argue with God. And he feels like, you know, these, these, these Ninevites don't deserve it. They're evil. He had, he had forgotten the things that he had done that were evil as well. This is also an, uh, an interesting picture since Jonah is the author here. If Jonah's the author of this, it gives a, a real good description about how honest the Bible is. Because if you were writing a book about you, I would not put chapter 4 in here. I would have stopped at chapter 3. Yes, mission accomplished, we're done. But chapter 4 is all about Jonah and his bad attitude. So this is a great testimony to the authentic and realistic and honest nature of the Bible. So also remember that Jonah had some pride because he had predicted their destruction. So he also, he was a prophet who predicted the destruction of the city. He prophesied against them. And his personal prediction was, hey, they're not going to repent. So he had a reason to say, you know what? I think they're, they're not going to do it. So he was mad when they did. He had a lot of excuses for why God's mercy didn't seem very wrong to him. And this, this verse says that he became angry. And that word angry is not just, he got a little mad. It is exceedingly angry or irritated extremely angry, very, very mad. But the truth about Jonah here is that Jonah is dead wrong with his attitude, and he doesn't get the heart of God at all. Jonah had obeyed the Lord by, by going to Nineveh and preaching God's message, but the attitude of his heart hadn't been changed to love. So he didn't have God's heart. So he did the right thing with the wrong motive. And we see verse 2 in his anger, in verse 2, he said, he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. 
I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from the sending calamity. So this is the first prayer we've seen, the, the Bible records, uh, since he's been in the fish. So have you ever given a compliment to someone and it wasn't really a compliment? If you look at this verse, he, he says a lot of great things about God. God, you're gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. But it's not really said in a complimenting way. Sometimes our tone doesn't match our words. You know, a couple years ago, I was listening to the, the Chiefs game on 101 The Fox. Uh, you should do that if you can't watch the game today. It makes Jesus happy. Um, it's a home opener, got to say it. Um, and I was listening to Mitch Holtis, who's the voice of the Chiefs, and a, an exciting play just happened, touchdown had just happened, and he realized, you could see in it off in his mind, that he has to put in a plug, an advertisement for K Jewelers. And you know how it's real sweet? Every kiss begins with K and all that. Well, he was fired up from the, the touchdown. He was like, and brought to you today by K Jewelers, every kiss begins with K. And, and the tone of his voice was not matching the sweet tone of what K Jewelers probably wanted him to do. Sometimes the, what, the words that we're actually saying don't line up with our tone or attitude of voice. So I know you're a gracious, compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. So God is abounding in his love. And I hear, often I hear that some people say the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are, are different gods. You see a different heart with God there. And that's not true. All the attributes of God in the Old Testament are there in the New Testament. And all the attributes of God that are in the New Testament are there in the Old as well. God is unchanging. So we see that an evidence of this here is that God, he is a gracious, compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. So God isn't this wrathful God in the Old Testament and a loving God in the Second. He is all of those things in all parts of the Bible. God's willingness to save both then and today is infinite. We see that in the New Testament as well in 1 Peter 3, verse 9, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Ezekiel 33, verse 11 says, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their evil ways and live. That's the heart of God. He doesn't want people to, to stay in their sin. He wants them to turn from their sin and, and come to him. So if this is true, why isn't everyone saved? Well, John 5, verses 39 and 40 say people don't receive eternal life because they refuse to turn to him. So we see Jonah here acknowledges the fact that God has great qualities, but Jonah wants him to be merciless. And all Jonah could do is, is dislike these Ninevites and not show love for them, even though the God who is abounding in love and mercy was showing his graciousness and compassionate, compassion to them. His, uh, Jonah's response in the verse 3 is, now, take away my life, Lord, uh, now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. So Jonah is showing himself as an arrogant, self-centered, proud, exaggerating man who is in no spiritual condition to pray. And he's so disappointed and angry that he, he'd just rather die. If he can't get his own way, I'm not going to play anymore. I'm done. Just let me die. You know, we see a parallel between his reaction and a couple other people in the Bible. And one of them is in the story of the prodigal son. So you see the, the son um, told his father, said, oh, just give me everything you're going you're gonna to give me when I die, my inheritance, and I'm going to go take it now. I'm gonna, you're dead to me. And he went off and he squandered it. And when he finally realized, came to the end of his rope and realized that this isn't working for me, he came back. And the father ran to him and threw a big party because his son had come back. But the parallel I see with Jonah here is not with the son or the father. It's with the other son. You see, the, the story also goes on to tell what the other son's response is to the, the, son, the, the brother coming and repenting to his father. And we see that in Luke chapter 15, and it says in verse 25, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, 
uh, has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you will kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So this other brother was bitter and angry because someone had come and repented and turned to God, came back to the father who loved him. The Bible says there's joy in heaven over one sinner turning to God. There's a party in heaven over one sinner returning to God. So think about how much rejoicing there was in heaven for an entire city, hundreds of thousands of people repenting and turning to God. But Jonah wasn't being a part of it. So today I don't have any any bullet points for you in the outline, Um, but what I do have are a few questions you can write down, any ones that kind of resonate with you this morning. You can take back and think, think about this week. And the first one is, what is it that you're bitter about that is not allowing you to enjoy the blessings of God? What is it that you may be bitter about this morning that you are not allowing God to shower you with blessings and you to enjoy them? Are there, thing, are, are there things of bitterness in your life that you're not, allowed, you're not able to enjoy God? Jonah just could not get past his pride and enjoy this miracle that had happened and celebrate with the people. So is it, is it you have a person in your life and you're, you're harboring unforgiveness? Is it little circumstances that happen? Problems at your job, car trouble, a bad hair day? Financial problems, your kids going crazy. By the way, kids are crazy every day. It's not a new thing. What is it that we're bitter about that is not allowing us to enjoy the blessings of God? You know, another thing that that came out of this and uh, had a friend of mine call me a couple weeks ago and said, hey, want to want to challenge you with something, which is always a great way to start a conversation. Uh, he said, I'm going to challenge you with something, and I, I want you to celebrate the things God's are doing in your life right now because I don't think we celebrate enough and sometimes we don't take the time to celebrate so another question I have for you is do you celebrate enough because my concern and this is, a, this is an undeveloped sermon I'm not, I'm not there yet with this but my concern is that we as Christians don't celebrate enough we don't have as much fun as we're supposed to we're a lot like Jonah and not like the people of Nineveh do we celebrate enough? But that sermon is undeveloped. I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail this morning, I don't think, unless God prompts me to. And we see in verse 4, after Jonah had given his response that he's angry and given him his half-hearted compliments, verse 4, we see that the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? So God is really asking him here, are you, are you wiser than me? Are you angry because my goodness He's trying to get Jonah to look at himself and see how foolish he's acting. And, and don't see what he's not saying. There, there, there is a righteous anger. There is, there is a righteous anger, a righteous indignation. That is justifiable in some cases, but in this case, Jonah is holding on to his anger and holding on to bitterness when God's doing a miracle. And he is trying to set himself up as the judge who is over the judge Almighty. Another, uh, another interpretation of this verse that I, that I read this week was Dr. G. Douglas Young. He said that, Jonah, I have saved Nineveh because I am in the, sa- the saving business and I save sinners. I want you to bring them the message of judgment to see whether or not they would turn from me. And if they turned to me, I would save them. They did turn to me and I have saved them. God fulfilled his promise. So another question I, I have for you this morning is do you always have to love someone before sharing the good news with them? Do you always have to love someone before sharing the good news with them? 
Jonah didn't love these people, but he did share good news. And, and the thing about good news, it sounded like bad news. Because the bad news he gave was, if you don't repent in 40 days, you're going to get wiped out. But the gospel, good news always has to have bad news to have good news. So there has to be, hey, if you don't turn, you're going to get wiped out. But if you turn, God will have mercy. So there's the bad news. And we have, that, we have very similar bad news for us. Not in 40 days necessarily. But we have bad news that we are also sinners. We've, we've, come, we've fallen short of the glory of God. That's bad news. We're separated by nature. But the good news is that Jesus died for us. Good news is always connected to bad news. But we have to make sure we focus on the good news as well. So another question I have for you is what good news are you not accepting this morning? So the bad news is I am by nature a sinner, but God is faithful to forgive if we ask him to. Is there good news that we have not accepted in some area of our life, that we've not allowed the gospel to speak into? Verse 5, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat in shade and waited to see what would happen in the city, or to the city. He is still hoping, after they repented, he is still expecting them not to do it. So he goes outside the city, goes up on the hill, grabs up a lawn chair, pulls out his phone, and says, I'm going to get this on YouTube. So there's, God's still going to destroy this, this city. So he stubbornly clings to his selfish wishes. So I had a, uh, a friend in, in college named Seberg. And he's a great friend to have around, especially if you're a future pastor, because he has all kinds of sermon examples. Uh, not necessarily in a good way. Uh, nice guy, but one day uh, I came out of the house we were living in and there was an upper, upper deck. And coming down from the deck were a very steep, steep set of stairs. And we had replaced the door upstairs and we had taken, taken all the stuff off of it and it was just a door. And he said, you know what, I bet I could surf down the stairs on this door. Did not meet code, by the way. It was really, really steep. So I, I can do that. And I said, hold on a minute. Uh, let me grab my, my camera out. Um, so I did. And I took a video of him doing this. Because I st stood by and said, oh, man, this is going to be good. And it was. Uh, and he got about three steps before he fell and was riding it down on his back before he did a somersault backwards. And the thing went right out from beneath him. And he hit every step on the way down. So it was fantastic. And I loved it. And I love him, but that was awesome. And I have it on video. That's what Jonah's wanting to do. He's like, ha, ha, I, got, I get to see you guys do this. I'm going to sit up here and wait for your destruction. Ha! Not quite the same situation and good-natured as trying to surf down the, uh, the stairs. But God didn't change his mind on Nineveh. And, and in this case, the Lord... Um, also didn't give up on Jonah. So in verse 6, we see, Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. What's amazing here is that look at the attitude Jonah has towards God. And Jonah still is being taken care of by God. So he's saying, Ha, I'm going to sit up here and wait for them to be destroyed. And God said, well, you know what? I'm going to show a little bit of compassion again and give you some rest, some shade to ease your discomfort. And if God has that much patience with Jonah, won't he have so much more patience with us as well? You know, this, was a, this plant was called a Palma Christi, and it was a common plant in the Middle East, and um, the speed of its growth is actually an act of God here. And the word provided that we see here that provided a leafy plant is the same word as provided the huge fish that we saw earlier. It's the same word. So God miraculously is doing these things all throughout the book of Jonah. And he's showing compassion on Jonah again. So, and in, in contrast to verse 1 here, where he was exceedingly angry, we see here this is an exceedingly happy about the plant. But this didn't last for long. 
The next verse in verse 7. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. So just like the miraculous growth, the destruction was also an act of God in this case. This is a picture of how earthly things sometimes very quickly float away. That some of our happiness, when we put our happiness and our identity and everything we have into worldly things, he was putting everything he had, all his happiness, into that plant. So God took it away. So this is a warning not to set our affections and hopes and reliance on anything that can be lost. And by the way, what, what things can be lost? Well, can your health be lost? Yes. Can your house be lost? Well, yeah. Could relationships be lost? Well, yeah. Your car? Yeah. Jobs? Yeah. So what can't you lose? Well, nothing. You can lose everything except God. So there is, God is trying to show him, don't put your affections, don't put your hope, don't put all your happiness, all your joy in things of this world and in your earthly comfort. And it is a good thing that God made the plant wither. You know, this week I was listening to Dave Ramsey, the guy who does Financial Peace University, and a lot of you in here have gone through his program. Um, and he is celebrating this weekend the 30th anniversary of his bankruptcy, where he was like a million dollars in debt and was dirt broke and went bankrupt. Um, and he said that was one of the best days of his life. It was one of the most stressful. It was hard in his marriage, and he was broke and didn't have anything. But this week he said that if he hadn't gone broke, he would have just been collecting things. And now... By the grace of God, he gets to collect stories. Stories of change, millions of changed lives. That was one of the best things for him because it changed his entire life and the course of his families and changed millions of people as a result. But he had to hit bottom. He had to have something taken away so that he didn't just spend the rest of his life chasing money and things and toys. So in verse 8, we see, When the sun rose, God providing a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head, so he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, It would be better for me to die than to live. Another parallel we see here in the Bible is Elijah in, verse King, in 1 Kings 19. Verse 3 says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And the reason he was running for his life is he had just defeated the prophets of Baal, and they wanted to kill him. He had had this miraculous thing done, and he was running for his life now. But when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, he said to the Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. You know, Elijah wanted to die. And what he needed was, in this case, was physical rest. Jonah needs some of that too. But Elijah, God provided Elijah with the things that he needed right where he was at. And what Elijah needed was physical, he needed food and sleep. And God provided that. So he said, okay, get up and eat. And he did. And then he said, go back to sleep. And he did that twice. And then he was rejuvenated and able to make the, the trip to where he was supposed to go. All throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus does the same thing. He meets people where their needs are. Sometimes he fed them. Sometimes he healed them. Sometimes he rebuked them. Sometimes he taught them. So another question I have for you is, what are your needs? What do you need? And are those needs spiritual? Are those needs physical? Mental? Emotional, what do you need this morning? And if Jesus is in the business of, of meeting needs, and this compassionate and loving and gracious God is in the business of meeting needs, are you going to him with those needs? Ask him for, the, for it. Or are we content like Jonah to complain about it and say, just let me die, I'm done. You know, jo Jonah needed some physical rest and God gave it to him with the plant. But you know, Jonah also needed a rebuking by God. And God was happy to do that as well. 
verse 9, we see that, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, Jonah said, and I'm, sorry, I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. So Jonah here is resorting to back talk, which if you are writing anything in your, your outline this morning, go ahead and write bad idea next to the back talk of Jonah. Remember how, if you're, if you're younger, you probably don't. Remember how when you were younger and you mouthed off to your, your parents and they'd actually hit you? I was in my upper 20s last time I got smacked by my mom, and I deserved it. So she said to me, you're never too old to get a thwapped. So, and it was true. You're never too old to get thwapped. And in this case, by God, you're never too old to get thwapped by God either. Back talking is a bad idea. Verse 10, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you didn't tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. You know, Jonah hadn't done anything to, to help this plant along. And sometimes the things we love are so trivial. And, and the thing that Jonah was caring about was so trivial, he didn't care for it. And he had forgotten the hundreds of thousands of souls that he should be loving. And the, the passage ends with a, a very piercing question. And before I read it, you have to agree that even though the, the outline ends there, you agree to stay with me for three or four more minutes. Otherwise, I'm not going to read that last verse. Because normally, if you do that, people close up, they're done, and uh, it's time to go. Well, I'm ending early anyway, but you've got to promise me or I'm not going to read that verse. The passage ends with this piercing question. And, I should, not have cons- and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? And that's, that's where Jonah ends. You know, the, the reference here to 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. Many scholars believe that this is reference to how many children there are because of that can't tell their right from their left. And if there are that many children, how many more adults would there be as well? So you have several hundred thousand people. And Jonah ends a really abruptly with a very piercing question. But it leaves two things in view. The smallness of man and the greatness of God. You know, these four chapters, most people call them the the story, Jonah and the whale. But this could have been called the story of God and his compassion. The story of God and his good news. The story of Jonah is not really about Jonah. It's not really about Jonah and the whale. It's not about Jonah's rebellion. It's not about Nineveh's repentance. It's not really about any of those things. It's about the very heart of God and his infinite compassion to love people. And Jonah doesn't get the heart of God. Do we? All of us have people in our lives that are more difficult to love. So one of the questions I have for you this morning as well is, who are your personal Ninevites? Because we think, no, yeah, Jonah was a jerk. No, he didn't love those people. And then when you say, hey, talk to this person at work, you're like, "Uh uh-uh, they don't deserve it. Who are your personal Ninevites? Who is it for you that you have no desire for God to show mercy and you kind of pray, hey, God, will you just kind of make their uh, their front tire blow out this morning so that I don't have to see them at work? Who is your personal Ninevite that you you pray bad things over? You know, Jonah wrote this book, and some commentators believe that after this, he went down and actually changed his mind and rejoiced with the Ninevites. We're not sure. We we don't know from this account. But some commentators say that he ended there, but then later repented and went down and celebrated. And I hope that's true. But do you know what happened 150 years later? Nineveh was wiped out because they went back to being wicked. And another prophet named Nahum, if you want to read more about the Ninevites, Nahum prophesied that they'd be destroyed again. And this time they didn't repent. And they were. So Jonah predicted it was come to pass. And it did, come, it did come to pass. But the heart of God is to provide us with good news. 
And we have similar good news today. And if, if you personally have never tasted that good news, and you, or you don't even know what I'm, I'm talking about, you can find, as, as you leave, you can find one of us fat guys that's standing around outside there in the lobby. And we'll be happy to talk to you about that. So I, as, I, as I close, I'm going to give you a couple minutes just to kind of internalize things, to kind of get along with God and process and say, what, God, what would have my name on it this morning? Go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes and, and ask God, God, what do you have that has my name on it this morning? What stuck out in the book of Jonah this week? Could be from the first three chapters. It could be from today. Maybe you're, you're bitter about something. You're not allowing God to to let you enjoy the things that God wants you to enjoy, the blessings. Is there, is there good news that you're, you're not accepting in your life? You're not allowing the gospel to penetrate all areas of your life? Maybe God's saying, hey, what do you need? And come to me with your needs, because maybe I'll give it to you. Who is your personal Ninevite or Ninevites this morning that you don't want God to show mercy on, that you need to, you need to pray God would take that bitterness out of your life? What's God speaking to you this morning? God, of all the people in this story, there are a lot of, a lot of people to identify. Do we most identify this morning with Jonah and being angry and bitter? Or do we identify with the Ninevites? That we were lost and broken, but now we get to celebrate because we turn to God and God has shown compassion on us. Make us more like the Ninevites who celebrate. Allow us to enjoy the things you want us to enjoy. And as we come to you this morning to, give our, to receive our offering, we ask that you would receive our act of worship through giving. In the name of Jesus, who provides all things, we pray, amen. Ushers can come forward. A couple things while they're coming forward and doing the offering. We have uh, care groups that are going to be starting next week. We are going to be, go ahead and go. Um, we are going to have a church-wide study, probably on spiritual warfare. Uh, so we're going to, uh, we really encourage you guys to sign up for a care group. There are sign-up sheets in the back right there by that table, as well as a half sheet of all the groups that are available this, uh, this fall. So if you're, you're saying, you know what, I don't know what I want to sign up for yet, but I want to know what, what's available, we have them uh, five days of the week. So we have them... Sunday, Wednesday, Thursday, I guess, Sunday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, four, four days of the week. And we have a lot of different uh, groups for you to be involved in. So go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm going to speak a blessing over you. Your God is a God of compassion and graciousness, slow to anger and abounding in love. Go now and enjoy with an attitude of thanksgiving and blessing. Unlike Jonah, but like the Ninevites. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Bless you.